when they got rid of uh, Tower of Terror and made it made it live. <laughs> no, they, no, they didn't make it live. They made it. Uh, yeah, Guardian of the Galaxy, yeah. guys. We are live though, is what I'm saying, Jerry. Oh. We're talking oh, we're Guardian live. of the Galaxy, oh, and we are live, is what oh, I'm so saying. We're, live. we're talking about Disney. <laughs> Hey, Mr. To Jerry Mike. is going to Disney next week. So before we went live, we were talking uh, Disney, <laughs> and I pushed live so that you could hear that we were geeking out about Disney, guys. A couple of Disney nerds over here. So true. Jerry, how the heck are you, man? Man, awesome. Doing great. Doing what great. Uh, What's good. new since uh, last week? Oh, just, you know, doing deals, making money, living the dream. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So you and your family... You get to go uh, enjoy some time away, headed down to Florida, and it could be, could be that maybe they'll lift the masks before you even get there. Could be. Come on. That would enhance the experience for me. Dude, that would just be good. So you're going to get away with the fam, have some fun, which yep. is awesome. What uh, is that? Uh, I, I always get the question. What's the number one thing that you love most about entrepreneurship and just wholesaling, real estate, fix and flip? Like what, what has it brought? What's been the greatest byproduct or blessing that's come from it? Well, I mean, financial security is always nice, but that's kind of a byproduct to me. You know, money to me is always just a means to an end. It's what, what does that do for you? Um, I mean, I'm all for nice stuff, but it's more about the experiences for me with, you know, I have, big family and I want to be involved in what they're doing. I want to, I want to go and see the world. So that's always been for me, the, the greatest blessing. Um, you know, we homeschool our kids and what that does is combining that with entrepreneurship to me really allows to have a lifestyle that's kind of unique and different than most people. And yep. it, I mean, like right now is spring break this week is spring break. And I'm like, we're not going, we're not, I'm not doing spring break when everybody else does spring break. Let's do it when everyone else is not doing it. Right. So, so true. Yeah. I mean, that's for me, that's some of the greatest blessings of that and and having that flexibility to pick and choose when you work. I mean, there's times where I got a lot going on and I'll, I'll uh, go do that fun thing that the kids are doing or whatever. And then I'll work at night when they're all in bed or, you know, just whatever, or take time off. Like we did, we went to California for three months one time. We just rented a beach house Went there for three months. Sweet. You know, I worked a little, but it was like that flexibility is my favorite part of it. Love it. Love it. Look at this. We need to do a video in Disney, Jerry. <laughs> That's Whoa. right. Sir. Let's go. Let's make this happen. Tyler's Let's my Jerry. video guy. So Tyler's, he, he, I know why he's saying that. He wants to come along. He the... just wants the free trip. I know right. Tyler. I know Tyler. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. However, that would be a sick video. <laughs> All right. Well, we've got plenty of people in here. So let's do a breakdown of what to do when, uh, guys, just to kind of give you an update, we're going to be talking about what you do when you come across homes that are like a disaster. Maybe they've been on fire in the past and it's still like a half burnt down home. What about the ones you go in that have mold or meth or all the problem homes, the stinky homes, the smelly homes? Is there a way that we can... Um, how do you how do you combat that? So we're going to be going over that today. As you uh, as you know, guys, this is a live. So as we are going on, this is a live Q and A. So we'll get to as many questions as possible. We do our best. We know there's a ton of questions out there, but we will absolutely do our best to answer as many as we can. And uh, we're just excited to be with you again. I think we're on week eleven. I should know this. Maybe we should number it. I'm going to have my assistant number it so I never have to guess anymore for us, Jerry. <laughs> Thank you. That'd be helpful. <laughs> um, so we're, we're going to have some uh, direct data here in, in the in the future. And we we may have a guest pop on. That would be great. We'll talk about a deal if they do, right? Yep. Yep. Hey, you know, speaking of the hair, you know, like I kind of need like a trim, but I'm just so, I'm just having so much fun growing. I think I'm just going to grow it until it's like just like huge. Bro, so I'm with you on that. I think you actually have to grow it big. Like you, you do. You got to go big or go home. When you get a new do and you get some you get some new brown locks in there, bro, you got to go. You should see me, Cody, in the shower. I'm like, oh, man, this feels so amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Okay. Well, let's get going into this. So we'll. Okay. Uh, there's a chance we'll have a guest hop in. 
He uh, might have been having some uh, internet stuff. Usually it's Jerry with the internet stuff, but not today. We traded places with someone today. So uh, we may have a guest join us here in the next little bit that's going to break down a case study deal. But guys, bring on your questions and we'll start going with some QA right now. Um, is there are any exact comps in terms of. Okay, let's go with maybe a comp question real quick before we get going, Jerry. Okay. Uh, when comping houses, if there aren't any exact comps in terms of bed, bath, what's the next step? Mm. I like square footage. Well, so square footage has got to be your number one yep. feature, right? So you always look at square footage. I try to keep within a range usually, give or take 500, you know, depending. Um, beds and baths are always good. But really, the, the, never forget the whole point of comping a property. You're looking for like properties to the subject property. You're looking for you're looking for sold homes data that supports a value, whether it's an ARV after repair, whether it's an as is value. You're trying to establish the value of your subject property based on the exit, the possible exit for that deal, so that you can create a baseline to then discount, so that you can buy a deal or get a contract at a deal that allows you you to have room to wholesale it or fix and flip it, right? So. When you kind of, a lot of times we lose sight of the big picture, which is why am I comping? Well, you're comping so that you can establish value. And so you want to make sure that you're looking at the right type of properties, the right neighborhood. The three big things I always look at are, is it similar in features? And that could be lot size, that could be style, two story, single story, that could be brick frame, that could be basement, no basement, yeah. right? Bedrooms, baths, square footage, all those things that you kind of want, nothing's always exactly, but you want to be as close to your property as possible. Then you want to look at distance. How far away is it from the subject property? Try to stay in the same neighborhood, ideally. And then how old is it? The newer it is from when it's sold, then the better the comp, right? If it sold yeah. yesterday, that's an amazing comp because it's brand new. If it sold a year ago, that's a little older, right? So at the end of the day, you're looking for, is it similar? Is it close by? And is it recent? And that's kind of what makes up the rules to comping a property, you know, in a nutshell. I love it. I don't know if there's anything I can add there. Uh, next question will tie just because it's so close to it. Can you wholesale without comps? Guys, heavens yes. Not just yes, heavens yes. In fact, I tell people if you're spending more than two minutes comping, you're doing it wrong in the first place. Um, to go back to just about a year ago, I don't go on many of the appointments um, I have my team go on majority of the appointments, if not all the appointments, but sometimes when we're shorthanded, I'll put the boxing gloves on and get back out there. And one about a year ago specifically is to answer this, uh, Francisco is I was on in the office. My team was gone down in Lake Powell on the houseboat and uh, we were just very shorthanded. So one of our, uh, it's actually my executive assistant. She comes in, she's like, Hey, I picked up the phone to this lead. I, it's, it's super hot. They're motivated. And I didn't even ask her like, hey, what is it? Like, what makes it motivated? I just loved how excited she was that I'm like, I'm just going to go out there regardless just to, just to give the respect that she's so excited about this lead. So I went out there. Guys, no comps. All, I, all she gave me was the address. And on the way out, all I did is I called uh, a guy in the office and I said, hey, just give me a ballpark, like literally 10 second ballpark. And he's like, I don't know, probably around like 250 is the ARV after repair value. I'm like, perfect. That's all I need. Guys, 10 seconds. And the name of the game is, Francisco, just get it as low as possible. And that sounds so, oh no, there's got to be more to that. There really isn't. And part of the wholesale game is negotiation. And you want to make your offer unrealistic and to solicit a no. And so I don't need a comp to do that. All I need to do is be able to anchor a price that's unrealistic and solicits a no. Because the no is the beginning of all negotiation. And that's all I care about. So I'll go in there. And if they're, they were at this particular home, they're at 220. And I was like, Awesome. And I started, I'm like, it sounds like you want, you know what you want for the property. We started walking the property. Ultimately, I anchored, anchored, right? They're throwing a kite at 220. I anchored back down to reality. And I said, what if I'm able to do 120? Guys, I was $100,000 below 
what they said. And then we just started working, working, working. We ended up walking out of there about, I walked out of there in about, oh, maybe an hour later at uh, 145. And so that lets you know what we do. I, I don't really care about the comps as much as just get out there and just get it as low as possible. And in this market, tis the season. You can put on the back on the market and sell it for a for a big old uh, uh, profit. So that's hopefully answers yeah. with a little bit of story, a little bit of dialogue. Yeah, that's awesome. So Cody, you know the topic that we decided to to go on today. I got a hot story for this, by the way, on this topic. Good. So do I. A recent one too, and. Um, I want you guys to know here that I'm hoping Cody and I bring a, a little bit different perspective maybe because I understand Cody's philosophy now that I've hung out with him quite a bit and I and I kind of know where he – the angle he takes with a lot of this, which is just like the question he just answered, which was, look, I just want the highest and best price with whatever the deal is. Let everybody else figure it out and fight over it, right? And that's yeah. – I mean, I'm generalizing a little bit there obviously, but um, – so we're going to talk about this though, because you are going to come across a lot of odd properties. You know, I deal with coaching students and it feels like stump Jerry is the name of the game. Hey Jerry, I got this studio mixed use property. What do I do? I don't know, you know, or, Hey, I got this, uh, I got this duplex that needs converted back into a single family, even though it's in a district or it's in a street where everybody's got duplexes. I want to convert it back into a single family. What's that? I, I don't know. Or, you know, I got this fire damage property or I got this foundation property or whatever it is. And everybody seems to think there's some kind of like secret formula to like, OK, well, what do we do with this deal? It's a problem property. And guys, at the end of the day, who's the ideal buyer? Can you understand that buyer? Do you have some kind of understanding of what the issues are? And just know that the more layers of issues a deal has, then the smaller the pool of potential buyers. That's it. Is there a buyer for a studio in a mixed use place? Yeah, but you know, are there, it, it's gonna be a very concentrated small pool. That's if right. you know that and you're willing to work that lead and find a buyer, fine. Just know what you're up against, right? The more layers and the more complications to a property, and that goes for big rehab properties. You know, hey, the thing's gutted down to the studs. Well, yeah, you can wholesale that thing, but the amount of flippers that are going to buy something gutted to the studs is going to shrink because there's a lot of problems to figure out. So I got some ideas on that I want to talk about. But Cody, am I kind of nailing that or is, is that kind of what we have to think about when we when we come across these odd or big problem properties? Yeah, yeah, there's it's it's making sure if it's going to be odd. The biggest thing is then you've got to get it at a big discount. It can't be just your typical 75 percent minus AR or minus repairs and then whatever you want for your fee. Um, that's something when you have that wide pool of buyers and you 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 got a lot of eyes that want that. So it's definitely going to be completely a completely different and a lot less um, of, a, of an evaluation instead of 75%, maybe I'm going to do like 60% or 50% minus yeah. repairs plus my minus my fee. And, so and I love different. that. I love, and I'll give you a story real quick. I did this wholesale deal, Cody, uh, and everybody listening in Indianapolis. And when I first got the contract, um, I thought, wow, this is this is an amazing deal. Well, uh, undisclosed was a foundation problem. And it only took a nanosecond for me to discover it. Now, I haven't seen this property, right? Because the minute my first cash buyer looks at the property, he's like, dude, you got a foundation problem. Okay. Yeah. So now I know, okay, I got to deal with something here. And what I did, here's how I solved this. Um, I found a foundation specialist in that market, uh, a structural engineer that does foundation stuff in that market. They went out, they did a formal written bid of what the issues were and what the cost was to fix the issue. And it was like $9,700 to fix this basement issue. And now I had that piece of paper with that written you know, bid on it. And now what I did is every cash buyer then that I took, the, well, first of all, Cody, I did exactly what you said. I went back to the seller and I said, hey, listen, we got a problem here. There's this major foundation issue. Yeah. I can no longer pay this. I got to pay this because now I got to deal with this issue. Yeah. And I got this huge discount, rightfully so. It's got a problem. Yeah. Even if I wholesale it, the buyer has to deal with that problem. Now, even if I, even with a bid on how to fix it, it's still another problem someone has to deal with. So I got a big discount. Then I, then I figured out the cost of it. 
got that in writing. And then every cash buyer that was interested, it was like, oh, by the way, there's a foundation issue, but here's the solution to the problem. And then it, it, it almost immediately like eliminated the issue in regards to it no longer being something scary that a buyer had to be afraid of. Yeah. Yeah, dude. I, I love that. So you're already, you're already creating the solution, not just for the seller by, by being able to be a cash offer, convenient speed, no closing costs, no realtor fees. You're also now thinking on the back end how to be that solution for that buyer. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. I kind of like to call it uh, full service wholesaling. And this is a different mindset. I know Cody, you kind of treat it sometimes a lot different where you're like, I'm not a cash buyer employee, but a, a one idea, and I love that analogy, but the, the, the more problems I can solve for my potential buyer, meaning if they're going to run into things that are scary, then the easier I make it for them to pull the trigger and make a decision. Yeah. So sometimes you, sometimes you, and you just got to weigh that there's, so there's no right or wrong answer to that. Like I remember we were talking about land and it's like, yeah. well, land, there could be a hundred layers of issues before you can even build on it. Are you willing to figure all those things out, solve those problems and then bring it to a buyer? Or are you going to just stand back and let them figure it all out? The more they have to figure out, the less buyers are going to come forward. That's all. Just understand yeah. that is all. Yeah. Yeah. How often are you coming across a home that you're like, oh, this could be a problem. Like this could be a problem for my buyer's pool. Like this might, I don't know if I have many buyers that want this home. Are we talking, this is one out of 10 or are we talking nine out of 10? Well, so for me, not that often, but for my students all the time. And here's why no one wants that property that you found. Yeah. That's why you found it. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I can't tell you, I deal with on a daily basis, people bringing me the weirdest crap and they're like, Hey, I got this deal. And I'm like, it's not a deal. That's a whacked out problem property. The reason why you have it is because everyone's passed on it. Yeah. And now you found it and you think you got this great deal and that there's some kind of secret, you know, recipe to do a deal here. And it's not, it's just, you. there's all kinds of hair on that thing. You um, know, so I just, I'm always talking about it with my students because they tend to, you know, they're like, hey, this property has been for sale for 800 days. <laughs> And, you know, and we don't know why. Yeah, <laughs> um, I've gotten a good one. Eddie Frazier, my man. And I got another one. So this one's saying, hey, dude, once a week is just not enough, y'all. We got to get you on a podcast. You guys will kill it. Um, Eddie, you're, you're inspiring us, man. And the other one, uh, I just don't know if I'll jump into it yet. It's like, you guys need to do TikToks. You guys would have a mega following. I <laughs> uh, know. One more platform. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Well, let me tell you a couple things, Jerry. This is, uh, we came across the home and um, it was, it was like within our first couple years and Mark goes out on it, my business partner. He goes out on this, on this property and guys, everything that can go wrong on this home was completely wrong. There was a toilet, by the way, plumbed in the middle of the living room. Doesn't make sense. I don't know why, but here's the thing. Mark shows up, he's on the doorstep and he calls me and he says, Cody, come to this one. I'm, I'm going to need some backup. And I'm like, Ooh, this sounds bad. Like I've never had to be called for like, uh, I don't feel comfortable going into this one. We knock on the door and we had just seen a bunch of like homeless people walking around the house. So Mark just didn't feel good about it. We knock on the door and as we're knocking, it's, it's evening, it's probably about six o'clock, it's starting to get dark. We see in the upper window, this flame just do, like just start burning. And they're cooking right there in the room, meth, drugs, like oh, everything's yeah. going down. We open the door and there's four tents in the living room all with like five individuals in it, asleep, all homeless people, squatters. And I'm walking in this home thinking, what in the heck? Like I, I, I was naive and nervous at this stage of my life. Now it's like you hear of a meth home. It's like, eh, just go out. And if you want, you can throw away your homes. I was like thinking, man, am I going to walk out like itching my skin? Am I going to be like, am I going to be like infected? And I was so nervous. 
everything that could go wrong. We go and the guy comes in. He's like, hey, I have to be honest with you. The plumbing in the sink, we snapped a broomstick off in it because we were jamming the needles down and they got stuck. <laughs> oh. Guys, when I tell you that everything that could go wrong, it went wrong. The tub had fallen through the floor and had gone and fell into the garage down below. This house was a disaster. However, we knew that meant we had to get at a deeper discount. It didn't mean it was bad. To get through this, Jerry, we enlisted. This guy was always methed out half the time. And so we always had to like call him, no answer. Call him, no answer. Drive out there, couldn't find him. And then one day we'd find him. And then he'd say, oh yeah, I know I need to get this done. Sorry, guys. And he'd get he'd recover for a couple days from drugs and then he'd get right back on drugs again. So we enlisted the neighbor, guys. This is how we get through these trouble, these big problems. We enlisted the neighbor. We knew that this home was probably not just an eyesore, but everyone wanted this home gone. Like these na- like these tenants, this, this owner, completely gone. So I enlisted the neighbor. We got him a bat phone. We got a cheap phone. We said, hey, anytime you see so-and-so, you take this phone over to him and you call us so that we can talk to him. Like, oh my gosh, we will help you. And so anytime that guy was around, we got on the phone with him, said, hey, here's the next step. We got to do this. There was a bunch of title issues, meth at higher counts than we still have never seen this count ever since that day. It was like 20 counts or 20 times the actual like legal limit. It was, it was ridiculous. Um, we did, Jerry... Um, going off of some of your philosophy and why it's so good, just like that inspection, we had a company that came in and already give us a quote for what it would be to mitigate that meth. It was 7,800 bucks and I was floored. I thought it'd be like 20 or 30. And so when buyers went through, they said, gosh, we know there's meth in here. I'm like, we're not hiding anything. We know there's meth in here. They were cooking it when we came here and put it under contract. And they're like, man, this is going to be like 20 or 30 grand just to mitigate this. Yeah. And so I'd show them that, that, yeah. that actual quote from this company. And they're like, oh my gosh, that's not bad. And it got them to make offers on every, yeah. uh, on this deal. And every buyer would come in just scared to death because they, they know it's just wrong in this house. Yeah. But that quote solved a lot of their problems. Because if you think about it, you know, for a cash buyer, they're like, you know, uh, I like this deal, but man, I don't know if that problem is a $20,000 problem, a 10000 I don't know. You know what? I got to do some work on this. I, I can't really pull the trigger right now. You want to remove as many of those layers of doubt as you can if you're dealing with a problem property, if you, if you want to increase your pool of potential buyers. Now, if you don't care and you're like, you know what? I got a 10,000 list buyer like Cody and I'm just going to put it out there. Someone's going to know their number. Someone's going to not care. Someone's going to specialize in meth houses, whatever. It's fine. I'm yeah. not going to spend any energy on it. But I've just found that it's it's you, you're always looking for your highest and best buyer, but you're also looking for any any edge you can on increasing your pool of potential buyers because solving that one problem by having that written contract on the meth remediation all of a sudden you might have a buyer go, oh, it's only seven. I I was I budgeted 20. I can pay 10 grand more now. Yeah. And all of a sudden yeah. boom, you make a higher offer and you just and you just made more money doing that deal. Yeah. So I just look at it like this. You know, if you're looking at a problem property, the one thing that that I always do is I want to make things very clear to the seller. I want to say to the seller, listen, let's do an agreement here. Let's put this in writing. But there's a lot of things going on here, right? Would you agree? Yes, you would agree. There's a lot of things going on here. You know, we're going to need to kind of get our head around this a little bit. And we're going to do our very best to, to make this work. But I just want to be really upfront with you that we're going to have to probably figure a few things out here and, and make sure that this, this actually is going to work yeah. for me and my investors. And then you just kind of open the door. You set the tone to where when you come back and you go, man, you know what? I didn't realize it, but it needs a new sewer line out to the road because that thing's jammed full of needles, you know, or whatever. And, you know, then you're, you're, you're kind of, you're, you're setting up the seller for you to be able to renegotiate if, if it's necessary. I love what you do there. So you're prep them. And this is, this goes back to a training, by the way, that very hand in hand with Chris Voss. Um, we're like avid students of Chris Voss. We have access to his mastermind 
great guy on negotiation. And he preps it this way on some of the things when you have to deliver like a punch, like we need to renegotiate. We use this technique that you just did. And I love this technique. And that is you want to blow it up like out of the water. Like if we have to come back and renegotiate, sometimes we throw it out there as simple as, you know what, Jerry, you're probably going to hate me. In fact, you're probably going to punch me. Yeah. And you're setting up this stage for awful, right? Mm -hmm. And you say, I can't purchase this home at this price. It's just not going to work. And all of a sudden they're like, Oh, that's not it. I was expecting something a lot worse than what you were saying. Like, I thought I was going to have to punch you. Like, no, that doesn't. But okay. And then it eases the whole entire conversation. We've had to do this where a guy came to closing. He was supposed to get around 20 grand at closing. Come to find out there was these liens that existed um, that the state tacked on literally two days before closing. The state's like, uh uh, here's this title, put it up. And now he had to pay seven grand at closing. And so my acquisition manager went in there and said, hey, uh, Shanae, please don't come into the closing for a second. I got to talk to this, uh, this seller. And he says, hey, you're going to want to punch me in the face what I'm about to tell you. Mm -hmm. And the guy's like, what? He's like, remember how you were going to get 20 grand at closing? He's like, you, you owe 7,000 to close. You're on coming time. with a check, not leaving yeah. with a check. <laughs> and he walked out, got a cigarette. And my acquisition manager said, I thought he was gone. Like, I thought he was just running out and see you later. And so we had to go out there, talk to him, bring him back to the table. They were able to call the state on the spot, figure out and work out and negotiate a little bit of a deal where he still walked away with five grand in his pocket. So it went from, yeah, he thought 20, but then he thought I'm going to have to pay. And then it ended up being 5K in his pocket. And so there are ways, and I love what you did because that's a great strategy when you're prepping people. Hey, listen, I don't know if this is going to work. I don't know if there's a cash buyer out there that wants this. I'm going to get back with you on this. And so when you come back, it's not a low blow and it's not, it's not, uh, it's not hard to renegotiate. Where, what's hard to renegotiate, Jerry, is when individuals go in there and promise the world saying, oh my gosh, we're good at this. We'll close this all day long. Like this is the yeah. easiest thing. And then find out from your buyers that no one wants it. And then you go back and say, hey, sorry, I can't buy it at this price. And like, dude, you came in here so excited, yeah. so jazzed, selling me the world that you were going to do this and you can't do this. You're not going to probably renegotiate that person. Yeah, that's that's awesome. To, so, so, Cody, I actually had that exact experience you're talking about where and I heard I saw a comment about a hoarder house. So we we did this virtual close. So meaning we hadn't seen the house. Right. And we have a, we have a signed contract. Uh, I send my guy out there, come to find out this thing's floor to ceiling full of stuff, like literally trails through the house. And I call up the seller, his name's Frank. And I say, Frank, you know, my guy went out there and met you, you know, and I just talked to him. And I, I mean, I, I hate to say this, but this is a no go deal, man. Yeah. Like I, I didn't even say we need to renegotiate. I just said, I'm out. Now, knowing like what you just said, knowing that, okay, that's the worst thing he could hear. Now everything else is going to be upside. So he says to me, he's like, well, what do you mean you're out? And I said, Frank, I mean, there's just going to be a lot of work because you're moving into a thousand square foot apartment. Clearly I'm going to inherit a lot of this stuff. And it's just, it's just more than I want to take on. Like, this is a lot. Yeah. It's more than I thought, you know, yeah. like, I, I just don't think, I, I just don't think this is right. I, I, I can't do this now. And he comes back and he says, Jerry, Jerry, wait, let, we can, we can make this work. I'm like, well, what do you have in mind? You know? <laughs> and he says, he says, what if we just do a $15,000 price reduction to cover, you know, all of the trash out that you're going to have to do, you know, cause I can't do it. The guy's older. Yeah. You know, he's like, I can't handle this. I'm like, I can't either. You know, he's like, I can't handle. I said, I said, I think, I think it's just, I'm just not your buyer. And so he throw, I didn't say a word. He throws out and says 15,000 and Cody, I was hoping to walk out of there with a 10,000 reduction. So right? he negotiated against himself. That's the right. best part. Yeah. And then just like you talk about, I wasn't like, okay, yeah, I'm done. You know, I was like, man, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. That's probably not enough. That's probably not going to work. And yeah. And, uh, you know, so, and then we end up doing a bunch more stuff, but anyway, it's, it's, uh, that exact idea, guys, you, when you come in over eager, then the immediate feeling is I'm overpaying or I'm losing out. You want the, you always want the seller to feel like he won out on the deal. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I, I love everything you said. And I love that you have the story to show like real time what's going on here and how you use that. Um, some of the problems that I can see that I can kind of relate to the question, Jerry, on, on some of this. One of them was, if it happens, this can be a big problem. What happens if you can't assign the contract do you have do you, and you and don't have the funds to close on it? So yeah. here's some of the problems, maybe even at the beginning stages, someone just getting into it and they're already thinking, oh my gosh, what if this happens? I can't assign it and I don't have the funds to close on it. What happens? Okay, so this is, is this? <laughs> I love this question. So this is so this is awesome. So first of all, uh, part of our culture and, and part of our upbringing is this idea that somehow if I sign this contract, it's legally binding, which means if I don't perform, something really bad's going to happen. I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to get sued. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to jail. Someone's going to force me to buy a property I don't want to buy. All of these bad things are going to happen. And it's all in your head. None of it's true. Nothing's going to happen. Yeah. Nothing is going to happen if you bust up a contract. Now, the seller might be mad or if there's an agent, they might be mad, right? Or if you've got earnest money and it's, and it's non-refundable, you might lose that. But nothing is going to happen if you can't perform on a contract. And if you've got the right kind of contract, you have a way out of that deal anyway. So it's simple. You exercise your contingency, you're out, right? And you're done. And no, no harm, no foul, no big deal. Nobody can force you to buy a house. I love it. That's simple. I don't need to add to that. Here's one I like because um, this can be a problem. And guys, I will tell you from this standpoint, I appreciate this question because I get this a ton. Jerry, I can only imagine you get this a ton. This is more of the wholesaler's problem than it will ever be the homeowner or the seller's problem. If there ever is a problem around this, it's because a lack of communication on letting them know what the process is going forward to close on it. And so as long as you're crystal clear and you're not, you're not hesitant and you're not shading around it and you're not telling yourself this story, most of us tell a story that doesn't exist. Most of us are thinking, oh my gosh, they're not going to want 20 people walking through their home. So I'm just going to be like, um, yeah, like... Um, yeah, we'll close on it. It'll be on this date. And, um, we just want to see it one more time on, on Wednesday at two o'clock. And then when 20 people do show up, that's when this seller will be ticked off because the lack of communication. So EJ, the biggest thing you can do is just have crystal clear communication with every seller that you ever work with. And you're a truth teller and a truth seeker and people will love you for it. So we basically set it up. And again, we blow this up like it's going to be really bad so that when it happens, they're like, oh, that wasn't that bad. So we really like to say, hey, we're going to have a small army walking through here. Yeah. Partners, contractors, inspectors, our realtors, we're going to have a small army walking through this place because we have to prep for the chance that there could be 20 people walking through it. But most likely, it's only going to be about five to 10. And so when they're thinking small army, they're thinking, oh my gosh, I got to prep for us, but it's only going to be for an hour. So we'll be in your hair for like an hour and you're going to be like, get these guys out of here. I get it, but it's very simple. It only lasts an hour and then we'll be done. And then when it actually takes place, they're like, that was easy. That, that, that wasn't hard at all. So prep them for bad. And then they will realize actually that wasn't that bad. And this problem is only the wholesaler's problem. This is not the seller's problem. It's a lack of communication. If it ever goes bad, nine times, if not 10 times out of 10, it's a lack of communication on letting them know the process. Yeah, so two things I'll add to that, Cody, is if it's vacant, guys, I add into my contract, uh, seller gives buyer unrestricted access to the property via a contractor lockbox, meaning... I can go in and out of there any as much as I want, as often as I want. That makes the whole thing way easy. Now, if it's occupied, you've got the problem Cody's addressing right here, which is you're going to schedule a time and you're going to get everybody interested to come at that one same time, that, that hour or two hour window, right? Because you do not want to be sending 50 cash buyers all at different times when there's a homeowner there. Everybody's showing up. That's going to be way too intrusive. It's not going to work, right? 
And that's not very good leverage anyway for your business. Yeah. So what Cody does, and I see him do this, is it's like an inspection party or an open house. Everybody, this is your window of time. Bring your partners, investors, contractors, everybody that's got to see it because that's it. When that time's over, that's your only chance to see this property. And then a quick, a quick tip is give the, give the owner a hundred dollar gift card. If he leaves, say, Hey, love this. Go, go out to lunch, go shopping for the afternoon. We're going to be here for two hours. Get that guy out of there. Get that owner Make out. Make it there. worth their time. Don't bring a $20 gift card. Yeah. Be a hundred dollar gift card. Cause then they're like, yeah. okay. Yeah. They love it. Um, I have to always tell people on when I do my lives, I don't drink Heineken's and these are not Heineken's. These are Perrier's. And so I always want to make sure my, my audience and the audience here is not like, dude, this dude's a lush. He's like drinking during this thing. It's a Perrier, but I'll be drinking it tonight. That spark, um, that spark, sparkling water or what is sparkling that? Sparkling water. That's all it is. Gross. Oh, dude, I'll convert you one day. I'll convert Everybody you. Everybody leave a comment and say sparkling water is disgusting, Cody. Guys, don't do it if you don't <laughs> feel like it though. If you like it, I want to hear comments that you love it. <laughs> um, hey, Jerry, here's something I think you always want to know. This is pretty cool. Student of Jerry here. I Devon. need a birthday shout out. Yeah, I just talked to Devon today. Devon, happy birthday, man. You're the best. You're a flipping genius. Bro, let's do one of these for him. Let's see. Oh, let's get it louder. <laughs> there you go. Happy birthday, Devon. Um, okay, okay, let's see. Do we want to go with problem questions or just questions in general, Jerry? Uh, well, let's definitely hit the problem problem, the okay. problem questions, and then we'll go. We all, we'll do what we can with everybody else. Yeah. Okay. Um, how do you suggest? Here's some problems that could be a problem. Do you like this one? Jerry, for on-market deals, and I think you're the beast at on-market deals. All my deals are off-market, Jerry, so I love mm -hmm. to hear your input on this. Yeah. Um, if an agent isn't cool with double dipping, maybe for sure break that down granular, yeah. that term. And then how do you suggest we should handle it? Yeah. So I call it double dipping, but it's really dual agency. And that's where you go directly to the listing agent representing the seller, tell them you're unrepresented and offer them to represent you as well as the buyer so that they can get the other side of the commission split. So that way they get a total of 6%, right? Three for the seller, three for the buyer. That's called dual agency. Uh, there are some states that do not allow dual agency. And then also some agents just decide not to do dual agency. If you think about it, there's a little bit of a conflict of interest because I'm kind of representing both parties. So it can be an issue for some agents and in some states. Now, uh, I don't let that stop me one bit. I still call the listing agent because what you can do is what's called designated agency and that's where another agent in the same office can represent you as the buyer. Um, so what that means now is it means the listing agent can get a referral fee uh, and split that because they're bringing in somebody. So I say to that listing agent, hey, is there somebody you work with in your office that could help me with the offer that would still benefit you? And a lot of times they're like, oh, yeah, for sure. No, definitely all we're looking to do here with the double dip or even designated agency is create some kind of a competitive advantage because when that agent's getting compensated more by working with you and that's an ongoing relationship for future deals, what happens is they're going to start to call you. They're going to give you the best shot possible at getting that deal. And that puts you at the top of the list with, with being in on that deal, right? So, they might give you tips. They might help you. They might let you know about it before other people. They might they might do a pocket listing with you on that where they you get the deal done before it ever goes on market. I have agents now where I've done dozens of deals with repeatedly rep ongoing deals because I've created a really strong relationship with them. Now they call me with their distressed properties before they even list them. Yeah, so that's the idea here, guys. If you go after on market, it's it's never about the deal in hand with on market. It's always about the relationship because unlike private, you're hoping to create an ongoing deal flow out from that agent from referrals, meaning they keep bringing you their deals as time goes on. Here's a good one, Jerry. I love that answer, by the way. Um, this I think can be a problem in most people's eyes on why they never really get into the game. 
is sometimes we feel like we have to be the best negotiator. We have to be out there and we just have to be solid. You got to have the gift of gab like Cody and Jerry or it's just not going to work. Guys, our beginning stages, I botched so many, so many um, appointments where I just said the wrong things. But there are some key things. Maybe I'll share uh, two or three tips and Jerry share two or three tips on, on some of the best negotiating. Remember to always use the soft words versus the hard words. The hard words are the word contract. I hate the word contract. Jerry hates the word contract. So we love the word agreement. So that's the soft word. So it's not really about as much as you think about negotiating. Yes, the better you get in negotiating, the more deals you're going to do. But I'm convinced anyone, no matter what level of negotiation, can put a home under contract with a motivated seller. And I, I really am, I've seen this time and time again from many individuals. Um, it just helps you get better. So first one is soft words versus hard words, agreement versus contract. That's always a big one. Um, another negotiating is he or she who says their price first loses. So live by that rule. Never give a price first, always them. And then always anchor for the third tip, anchor an unrealistic number and that solicits a no. So I said that earlier today already, but an unrealistic number that solicits a no that is crucial. So those are maybe three tips that I'd tell you for negotiate, but I, I'm, a, I'm a student of negotiation, meaning I'm always looking. Um, Black Swan is a fantastic one. That is Chris Voss, um, a book. If you don't want to get into a mastermind, his book is called Never Split the Difference. And we're definitely uh, students from that guy. So that's just one of the guys that I love to follow. Yeah. To add to that, Cody, I think what I would say is um, part of the problem with so the tighter your margins are, the more negotiation plays a role in getting a deal. Yeah. Okay. So what I mean by that is if you're, if, if you've got to squeak out of the deal, a uh, 3000 or $5,000 wholesale fee because the seller's not motivated, really that motivated, it, then your skill set is highly, highly critical to the outcome. Whereas if you do like Cody teaches and you anchor ridiculously low, then what happens is, is it requires less and less negotiation to get a good deal because you're creating such a massive spread that you can foul everything up and you'll still get a great deal because you just anchored really low on your offer. Go in really low and you'll be amazed at you're like, man, I, I actually don't even I, I got a great deal you know, because why? Just because I was willing to offer low and and that just was the outcome was I didn't need a ton of really hard negotiating tactics. The more you have to negotiate, then the tighter your margins usually are is what I found. Yeah. Very, 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 very true. Cody, but that's kind of what I found is, you know, the lower you offer, the less negotiating you need to do. Love it. Uh, Josh Jarvis, a follower of both of us. Uh, I just received an Instagram message from him. This guy's getting ready, uh, youngster, by the way, Jerry. His story's nice. pretty cool. He's getting ready to serve a two-year mission for his church. Where? And he used real estate to um, he used real estate to pay for his mission by himself. Two years that he's going to be gone, guys. So, Josh, your story was touching when you shared that. I appreciated you sharing that in uh, in uh, Instagram with me. Uh, amazing. So he's got a great question, but I wanted to give a shout out because this guy's 18 years old, I believe. And to do deals at 18 years old and then use that to go and serve people, I think is just phenomenal. Awesome. That, that, that always brings a little tear to my eye. So can you do a subject two with a reverse mortgage? That's always a big problem, Jerry. You see these deals and then you come to find out there's this reverse mortgage, mm -hmm. which is literally like um, the ghost in the, in the closet, right? Like this one, <laughs> this can ruin a lot of deals. Um, I have not seen a successful subject to with a reverse mortgage. Um, I just haven't seen it. That one is very tightly monitored. And that one is all you're doing is if you take it over, all you're doing is still stacking and making that, that value of that home keep depreciating because the bank just keeps getting ownership more and more that it goes on. So I haven't successfully seen it done. Jerry? The, why, the reason why that is, everybody, if you don't know, is because they're now paying, they're now making a payment, which is drawing from equity. 
So the more it's drawn from equity, the, 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 the equity is shrinking rather than when you pay principal, you're paying down and gaining equity with a reverse mortgage, you're shrinking the equity. The so bank it, is it, sucking it out every month. It creates a complicated situation for subject two. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe if it's early on, I don't, I don't know. I, I've never done a, I've done a lot of subject two and I've never done a reverse mortgage. Yeah. But hey, good. by the way, Josh, um, while you're knocking doors on your mission, write down, write down addresses and send them to Cody and Jerry of distressed properties. Let's go. Doors. Let's go. <laughs> I love it. I Just love kidding, it. Josh. Don't do that. Focus on your mission. <laughs> um, and notice I didn't say that. That was Jerry. <laughs> um, all right. How do I make sure I'm not calling? This can be a problem. How do I know, make sure I'm not calling someone on the DNC list? Guys, DNC is do not call. Let me add to that so we can knock it out the same. Litigator list. It's litigators are the guys that are just sitting there praying for you to call them so they can sue you. Uh, DNC list is it's get a great either telecommunications attorney or someone like real estate attorney and get their blessing if you're going to be cold calling and you are indeed calling a do not call list. You hear the stuff out there. I've heard it on YouTube. I've heard it from many people that, hey, it's okay. You can call the do not call list because you're not at, you're not trying to sell anything. You're actually trying to buy their home. So it's not soliciting. And that may be true and it may not be true, especially depends on where you live and what the state sees it as because real estate is seen completely different in every other state. So just make sure you get with a good attorney before you do that. So the way you can make sure you're not calling someone on the DNC list is there is softwares out there that you can upload your list. Uh, does Flipster have that, by the way, where you can scrub oh, the DNC? It your own. It, it, there, is the, there is the website though that, what is it? dnc.com or whatever it is. I think it is dnc.com. Um, but yeah, guys, you can, there's softwares out there where you can just upload your list and they will scrub it through. They'll run it through the DNC and litigator list and spit out all the ones that are fine and hold off all the ones that are bad. We don't Cody, because some people it's, it's an issue. Some people it's not, some people care. Some people don't care. Just know the inherent risk guys. If you're not scrubbing the list and you're calling you could get an ambulance chaser that's gonna, you know, do the legal thing, and you're gonna owe, you're gonna owe a fine. Yeah, yeah. Here's a good one I like from uh, Chris K. This can be a problem, guys, because this can be the difference between you getting the deal or someone else doing the deal. Remember when Jerry yeah. just a few minutes back was talking about serving um, the end buyer? This mm -hmm. is a strategy that most people don't do, and that is serving their end game, the seller, yeah. helping them get to plan B. Um, I didn't know about this when this happened and took place. One of our acquisition managers named Selver, the biggest heart of gold. And we just absolutely love Selver. And he went out on this appointment and this individual needed to move, but he was diabetic and he couldn't, he couldn't walk great. He didn't have any means to be able to uh, pick up any of his stuff, furniture, belongings to get to plan B, nor, nor did he have any transportation. So he didn't even own a car. So we find out like a couple weeks later, um, we're in the office and it wasn't Selver. It was another individual on our team saying, Hey, wasn't that cool what Selver did? And I'm like, what did he do? And he's like, Selver went to that individual and spent all day Saturday and all day Sunday moving him into an apartment and he paid for his first month's rent, not on the company dollar, which we would have gladly done, paid for his first month's rent and he didn't have a truck, Selver. He had a Tesla and he just little by little was able to haul this guy's stuff to plan B. But because of it, we are able to continue to move forward with this deal where this guy says, I can't move until I'm in plan B. And because Selver has a heart of gold, he transitioned all the way to plan B so that we could indeed get his home. Yeah. So guy, I love that. That's a, what a cool story, Cody. What a, what a heart of gold. That's awesome. That's really awesome. Cool. Awesome guy. So the one thing I look at is if the, if the property's occupied, I always want to find out what that seller's plan is because 
it it could mean your deal doesn't get to closing if that pro if that if plan B is not solved, right? In other words, are they are they using the proceeds from the sale to buy their next house? Are they moving into an apartment? Are they moving out of state? What are they doing? And you want to make that your business. You want to understand that because otherwise, if if they're not solving that problem of where they're going when that thing sells, then it means it's not going to close, right? So you got to make sure you're understanding that. And that might mean you're solving problems. So we do what we do, what we're doing a lot of right now, Cody, is rent back agreements. Um, and now if you wholesale, your cash buyer has to agree to that. But a lot of sellers need 30 days after closing. They need the proceeds. You got to hold some money back in escrow. Um, there's a usually there's a, a per day rent number. But offering that to a seller could mean the difference between your deal being better than another cash offer because you're allowing, you're being creative now, right? You're helping that seller by giving them a little bit more time to, to get packed up and moved or to use that money they get to put on a deposit for an apartment or whatever it is, pay for a moving truck. Like that, that can open up a lot of doors for you in your deals. If you find out what the seller's intentions are for, for plan B and then be a part of the solution. Love that. I'm not going to show you what the mass majority said, but I do love my man, Nathan Blocks. that says, yes, I love it. sparkling water. <laughs> and wait, wait, wait. And Sterling, Perrier is my favorite drink. Now, I won't show the mass, the mass majority, but I will tell you, these two are now favorites in my book. <laughs> um, here's one that says, there's a big problem going on. I'm doing a JV deal currently and I can't get my partner to agree to a JV contract, what do I do? Are you you know enough about that to be able to answer that? Yeah. So partner meaning the other wholesaler. That's what I'm unconfused on. Okay. I, I I think that's what he means. If I were to guess, but I I don't know, so I don't know how to really answer this one. Yeah. So let's assume that you when you say partner, you're referring to your cash. You're you're referring to your your wholesaler JV partner. Um, and this is common. Here's a, here's the issue that you're probably running into. When you sign that JV agreement, you might be asking that wholesaler who's holding the contract to be exclusive with you. In other words, you can't market this deal to anybody else. You're going to you're going to agree to JV with me and only I'm allowed to bring a buyer and then we're going to split proceeds. There's JV agreements that say that. So I'm curious what your JV agreement is. If you're saying to the wholesaler, hey, I'm just going to put it out there to my buyers. And if a buyer comes forward, you're agreeing, we'll split it or whatever. But you're also allowed to market your own deal. It's your deal. Th then there's then that may be OK, right? That may not be a problem. So when you say he doesn't want to do a JV contract, Cody and I are kind of wondering, well, why? What is he saying? What's his reason? And there's probably he's probably got a reason why he's not willing to sign a JV with you. Yeah. What is that reason? Yeah. Very, very, very true. Um, here's one. What if I can't find a comp within four, um, four miles? Four miles. That's like forever away. Yeah. Here's um, one that I say is get it then as low as possible. Yeah. Like make sure you get that bad boy as low as possible. And um, I would throw out a very unrealistic number that solicits a no and I would make sure that, that those two things go in. And then when you throw out something unrealistic, I'm talking 10 to 20 cents on the dollar sometimes. I, I don't know the specifics behind this. If it's a land deal, I definitely have no problem going to 10 to 20 cents on the dollar. Um, but go very, very low. And they may come back and say, dude, you are up in the night. And that's where you can have fun with them, guys. This is supposed to be like we're negotiation. Most times it's you feel like it's a battle. It shouldn't be a battle. You should really be able to have fun with these people. So, hey, 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 in a perfect world, I would love to get it for 20 cents on dollar. I know in a perfect world, you would love to get up here. In a perfect world, I would get up here. In fact, we know we don't live in a perfect world. We're all still wearing masks. Our president doesn't know his name. Like, have fun with them. Do whatever you want, right? And just have fun with these individuals. And you will find out that you can't offend them and you're going to be just fine. We did just have... Mr. Richard McRae jump in down below. We can bring him on to bring up uh, one of his deals. Um, 
let's get him up here real quick. Hold your questions, guys, because we have a guest. Let me bring it on to a different screen. There we go. Uh, Mr. Richard McRae, can you hear us loud and clear? I got you loud and clear. Can you hear me? Yeah. So Mr. Richard McRae is down in Baton Rouge. And I love this guy's accent. He's got a little accent. He doesn't think he does, but he does. And I love this guy's accent. He's also hey, in the New Orleans. Here. What's that? Everybody talks like that here. <laughs> he also is a retired commercial airline pilot, if I remember right. And yeah. uh, he does uh, he does wholesaling in Baton Rouge and yeah. in New Orleans. And he has come across plenty of bad, bad problem homes. Because if you remember right, just a few years back, Baton Rouge was uh, flooded, wasn't it, Richard? 2016, yeah, 20,000 homes flooded. Yeah, so he's seen a big, big, big number of problem homes. So let's break down for them. We've been going for a little bit, and this will be a great break to give them another reality chunk of what deal that you're going to go down that we're going to talk about that you said had leaking roof, mold, flooring issues, uh, a pool that wasn't functioning. Let's break this down. Where did this lead come from first and foremost? How did you find it? Was it on a list? Was it from door knocking, cold calling? How did you come across this lead? Yeah. So, uh, but first, Cody, I just realized I'm probably an hour late because I thought it was seven o'clock uh central time and oh. i'm sitting there getting ready and then i finally clicked on the link and i realized y'all are already gone so i apologize for being late no don't you worry about it you're still here and you're going to be able to share some incredible value so don't you worry we're uh we've been rocking and rolling we've been we've been jamming awesome. and now you're ready to add a little more value so don't you worry about it okay cool so, so yeah this deal about, came where from, come from what's that the lead so it, it came from um we were doing cold calling on mojo at the time, and uh, and I don't even remember what the list was vacant. Probably it's probably our vacant list. Okay. And we were cold calling, and uh, so the lady said, "Yes, uh, do you rehab houses?" So one of my guys was on the phone and said, "Yeah, we rehab houses." She said, "Well, that's what it's going to take." And so uh, I love these, by the way, Jerry. When you hear someone say that, isn't that where you're like, "This yeah. is not a good." The, like my radar is already going up. <laughs> yep. Yeah, okay, so I got on the phone with her and I tried to get over there, you know, and, and make make some make something out of it right away. But she was like, well, no, you know, I got uh, all this stuff. I got to move and I'm not quite ready. You know, my daughter may want to buy it and all this kind of stuff. So she put me off and I, I just continued to follow up with her every couple of months to see how things were going. It took now, off. Plural, Richard. So when yeah. we're talking, you've been following up for months. Are we talking two months or what are we talking here? Yeah. So, uh, so generally, you know, I, you know, only a couple of months, you know, I may should have pressed the issue more, but you know, we were busy with other things and, uh, and, uh, and, and I probably wasn't as organized then as I am now, uh, and, and didn't have as many good people working for me as I do now. So, uh, so, but you know, I had put a, a, a follow-up call and then I may miss it and realize, you know, I was supposed to call her a couple of weeks ago. So I call her and, you know, just talk to her. And she kept procrastinating and putting me off, you know, saying, you know, well, you know, my daughter has her boyfriend is a rehabber. He's going to want to do it. He, he may want to make an offer. I love that one, too. How many times do you hear that, Jerry? <laughs> oh, yeah. So, you know, it's, it, it, you know, I, and I'm a little bit naive. You know, I, I tend to take people at face value. So I'm thinking, OK, well, that's that's the real story. So I'm saying, well, you know surely you're going to give them precedent over me. You know, they, that's your family. You you know, it doesn't matter what they offer. You're going to favor them. And so she came back with, uh, no, I don't owe them anything. I'm looking for a good offer. So, <laughs> Dude, so you're out there doing this follow-up. She wasn't ready. Was time on your side, meaning time can kill majority of the deals. Time can kill deals because someone else goes in there finds out, maybe assesses and finds the needs better than we did and they yep. get the contract. Right. Was time your friend, meaning by time this vacancy was now making the home also get more and more wear and tear with steroids plastered into it, meaning it's just it's just hurting the home even more. It's It's making it more depressed, recessed. I mean, was time your friend or not your friend in this case? 
Well, uh, time didn't, uh, I guess it didn't hurt, uh, hurt me that bad because nobody else stepped in ahead of me. I think other people were trying to locate her, uh, but just didn't, uh, you know, didn't have the resources to find her because she hadn't lived there for a few years. She had moved out and found another place to live. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, get, we happened to get her phone number. And um, so, you know, continue to follow up. And finally, uh, what I realized is that she had, she was storing a ton of things in the house. She didn't, she's, she's an elderly lady by herself. You know, and she didn't have anybody to help her fix it or to move her stuff out. And so finally, I said, you know what? You know, we help people all the time. Uh, I can hire a crew, get a get a moving truck over there, get a moving crew. We'll pack all your stuff up for you, load it up and move it to wherever you want us to move to. You know, we'll make it quick and easy. Yeah. So finally, she she called me, you know, after we had set for about a month, she, she called me, said, oh, you know, because she had said, OK, I got uh, somebody else is making an offer. And so, you know, I, ha I hate it when I hear that, you know, and I try to, you know, well, you know, what can I do to get your business today? Uh, but it doesn't always work out. So, but she put me on hold for another month. She called him. She said, hey, I'm ready. Uh, can you get that moving crew over here? So we went <laughs> to see the house and, uh, and it needed uh, a lot more work than I expected, really. You know, looking at the outside from the, you know, and I drove past a couple of times. Uh, it wasn't that, it didn't look that bad, but. Yeah, you know, it had a hole in the roof around the chimney. All the water was leaking in there. There was, uh, I, we're not allowed to say mold unless we're licensed uh, mold technicians. So I will say there, there was, was black, there uh, was green friends growing on the walls. Growing on the walls. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's right. <laughs> she had plants in the house. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and it was, you know, a lot of stuff. Uh, not every room was stuffed, but she kind of had a couple of rooms that she had, uh, you know, stacked her things into. Um, Oh, and the swimming pool. Oh man, I, I I generally don't like to deal with swimming pools, but uh, this one had been sitting for several years and somebody at one point had talked her into turning it into a terrarium. They dumped a couple of loads of gravel in one end of it and we're gonna make it a, a you know, like a, put some turtles in there. It was an awful idea. I don't know who would have told her that. And so, you know, the, the, the pool man quoted $20,000 to clean all the gravel out and fix the pool, reline it, uh, and fix all the pumps and everything. So what's a $20,000 repair just for the pool? Wow. So there's a lot of bad going on. You got plants growing or AKA mold. You've got, uh, you've got a broken pool. It's 20 grand to even fix. And those things are already a nightmare. Um, so and, you've got a bunch of problems going on. Jerry, what were you going to add? And Richard, your your intent is to wholesale, right? The, from day one, you're looking at this deal to wholesale, correct? That's correct. Yep. Okay, so, this, wholesale it. so what, what Richard's doing is, uh, guys, hope you're catching this. It's aligning exactly with what Cody and I have been talking about before Richard came on. And that is Richard's trying to get his head around this thing. So that way, when he takes this deal to a cash buyer, He's got some answers when they're like, man, that pool is freaking me out. Or man, there's 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 furry stuff on the walls. Well, that's freaking me out. Richard's if Richard's like, yeah, I don't know what the I don't know what to tell you about that. You know, do you want to buy the house? It's going to make it harder. Right. It's going to make it more difficult. So what Richard's doing is he's trying to figure out and get his head around the big, scary problems. So that way, when the when the cash buyer says, you know, I'm looking at this, I'm kind of interested. But man, that pool's got me worried. Richard can say, boom, here's a $20,000 uh, estimate to fix that pool. And boom, here's a problem to solve the, you know, not mold on the walls or whatever it is. You're, he's, he's figuring out the scary issues, getting answers to it, and then providing that to buyers to help them feel comfortable with the deal. Is that right, Richard? That's right. You know, and I, you know, I also pulled comps in the area. So when I send it out to my buyers, I can say, here are the comps that I'm looking at, you know, pull your own comps, but this yeah. is what I see. This is what I believe. And then, um, so there were online, there were two different uh, uh, sets of data coming back in different websites about the square footage, uh, you know, cause I had it at uh, 1900, something, almost 2000 square feet. And some, another website uh, showed it at 1700. Well, you know, that's three, 300 square feet can mean a lot of money. Yeah. You know, $30,000 uh, probably on this house. And so my, you know, after I'd sent it out to my buyers, they were asking me that. So I got my tape and went over there and measured the house myself and <laughs> verified that it was almost 2000 square feet. That's, that's huge guys. This goes back to that serving the end buyer and taking that question out of their mind. 
and going over there and just doing it. So many times it'd be easy just to say, I don't know, go over there and figure it out. Yeah. If you say something like that, they're going to give you a price based off of 1700 where this yeah, indeed did nothing but help Richard on this uh, by going out there and getting that. So he can indeed say, nope, it's more like close to the 2000 And then it starts to change the offering from those cash buyers. Yeah. Richard, did you measure exterior or interior to get your square footage? The exterior, uh, you know, and here that's how they they determine uh, value is the exterior dimensions. They they call that the living area. Okay, very cool. So I love it. You're definitely getting it. You're getting in and solving problems on this scary house, right? That's right. Yep. So I uh, solved the problem with getting all the stuff out and assured her that we would be able to close and give her money and pay all her closing costs, uh, those kinds of things. And what was the time frame? How many months did you say? Is this a year of follow up or how much? Well, actually, time? I was looking at my my notes. Uh, I found that property in May of 2019 when the first time I talked to her and I followed up until July of 2020 uh, when she was ready to move forward. So a little over a year. Holy smokes. So, guys, a year of follow up. That's the other gold nugget you have to take away when you hear people doing consistent deals. So many times we think about from new marketing, new leads. Guys, the consistent deal flow is yes, keep marketing going, never shut that off. That's that's an absolute must and that's how you're gonna produce deal flow. But to maximize how many deals, we just did one last month where we were doing follow-up by one text a month. How hard is that? That's easiest thing in the world. One text a month, we were doing follow-up for over three years. Three <laughs> years, guys. Wow. And this came to fruition finally. So follow up a whole, a little over a year to get this deal. And that is going to be the difference of why you are going to be around if there happens to be any kind of shifts or changes and why some people are not maximizing why they're not getting as many deals. It's because they're not doing this right here. This is how you maximize or like people say, squeeze all the juice, right? Or, or make sure you're capitalizing and getting as many deals as possible. Those are the actions that many are skipping out on. They're really good at this front end, getting the marketing going. But if it's not a low hanging fruit, they kind of just keep moving on to the next one, the next one. Guys, there's a ton of deals sitting in our pipeline right now. Uh, people that might've said no in the past, that very well could be a yes right now. And Rich McRae just shared a story of just how true that is. Yeah. Never, never forget guys, National Sales Association statistic 80% of sales are on the 5th to 12th follow-up. 5th to 12th follow-up, 80% of sales. Yeah. So follow-up's king. So Richard, here's something cool I've always loved. If you guys notice the name, Richard 20K McCray. <laughs> guys, this is a cool story. Um, I met Richard a few years back and his assignment was not 20K. And uh, it, was, it was lower than that. And he started telling himself, I'm going to start getting 20K, 20K assignments. I want the big ones. And so he even started calling himself Richard 20K McRae. And uh, <laughs> in, that mindset started shifting how much he started making on his deals, which I think is cool. Yeah, I've had uh, uh, quite a few 20K, uh, 20K deals since then. He about said it, uh, 20K McRae. Yeah. They're, yeah, they're not always uh, 20,000. You know, here in this market, you know, we're averaging about 10,000 as an average. Uh, but I'm getting more $20,000 deals now that I that I think that way. And I say that's who I am. Uh, I tend to stumble on those uh, more often. Here's a good question over here, Jerry, from Eddie. Hey, and I don't do this on the all market. So this is going to go back to you, Jerry. On I'm going to put this on you, the, the genius on this. Um, how would you or would you anchor low on on market deals also with a listing agent and hope for a counter offer? I find when I do uh, aim low, the listing agent shuts me down even without telling the seller my offer. Yeah, so great question. So there's definitely a different dynamic with on market than off market because the seller has come forward and said, I want to sell and I'm willing to establish a list price where, in other words, here's where I'm starting. Here's where I'm coming out. I'm telling the market, I'm telling the world that this is the price I want for the house, right? So that's all revealed. There's no uncovering what the seller's intention is. It's public now. 
Now, what they'll really take, we don't know. So the way I treat it, Eddie, is I just run my formula. I, I figure out my number and I called up that agent and I'm basically like, look, this is my number for this to work. Go talk to the seller. Now, you can go in a, a five or 10,000 below where you want to end in case the seller comes back. That's that's normal real estate, right? Nobody ever gives their first number with, with on market. It's usually a little bit of counter, but I'm just transparent. Sometimes I'll tell the agent, I'll say, look, I can give you a number and we can see where they counter, or I can just tell you my bottom line. What do you want to do? And I'll let the agent tell me, no, just give me your, your highest and best number. I'll go to the seller and we'll see if we can get something done. So yeah. it just kind of depends on how you want to do it. But just know in your mind that when you're dealing with on market, there's a number already established. You're coming in under that in most cases and saying, this is my offer. Now that now it's up to the seller to take your offer, ask price and figure out what they want to do from there. And, and, and if you're going to build in room to come up. My philosophy is I want to come up uh, incrementally and they come down exponentially. So for example, let's say I've got a 5K buffer in there or room in there and they're at 100 and I'm at 70 and they counter at uh, 90, I'm going to counter at 71. And then they counter at, at 80 and I counter at 72. See, I come up tiny bits because I got to come up to give them something, keep the conversation going but I'm making them drop like a rock in the, in the countering. Right. Yeah, dude. I love that. I love that. You're teaching me new things. Cause I don't do a, a lot in the, in that, uh, in that space. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, here's a great question. We see this all the time, Jerry. Uh, there are a lot of homes in probate. Yes. And they need to go through that before they can sell. No attorney is willing to do a contingency. How could I protect my interest if I pay those probate expenses? Thanks. So guys, two things, and I know maybe even all of you have something to throw on this. Two things to think about is because it hasn't yet gone through probate, you're going to want to be very specific with your real estate attorney and like your, your title company or your closing attorney. Because it hasn't gone through probate yet, that means it also hasn't been awarded to the heir yet, meaning that home most likely can't even be put under contract because who's signing it? Well, the, the, the guy deceased or the person that deceased isn't signing it and they're the ones still on title until it goes on through probate. So that's the big thing. You got to make sure, A, if you can get it under contract, and what do you need to do to make that legally binding? Because the deceased can't sign, obviously, and it hasn't gone through probate. So that's the first thing. The second thing is I would just see if you can back it with some kind of a lien or a notice of interest or some kind of a, a note on the property so that no one can buy it without at least your expenses coming back to you. That's the only thing I can think of uh, probably at the moment. But um, a lot of people think, oh, I've got this home, it's under contract and it's going through probate. And it's like, I don't know how you got it under contract. The deceased can't sign that. So Jerry. Yeah. So there's two things to think about. Uh, when, someone's, when someone dies, if they had a will, then, it's, then it goes through, they go, there's an administrator, there's somebody, there's an heir, they're, they're going to pay all the bills and then the heir can decide on how the asset is liquidated. If it was intestate, right? No, no will. It's got to go through a court, a court appointed process. And then there's a court appointed, they call it an administrator. The administrator is now going to decide uh, on the, on the sale of the asset. So at any point, whatever it is, whether there's an executor of the will, which is an error, or there's a court appointed administrator, they're not able to sell that property until it's gone through the entire probate process and it's at that point of sale, right? Yeah. Well, there's a time, there's timing on this. So the question I always ask when I'm dealing with probate is where are we at in the process here? Are we, are we six months out? Are we 30 days out? Has this been approved for sale? Like what's going on? You ask that question. And then I make my offer contingent on that. So there has to be, like, I have to say, listen, my offer is good for 30 days. If this thing's not ready to close in 30 days, or you can say 60 days, whatever you want to do, but I'm not going to I'm not going to tie up a property and it doesn't close for six months. And now I got to honor a price from six months ago and the market's changed. I need the option to reconsider my offer. Right. Yeah. So it's all about just understanding what's going on and, and what kind of what kind of probate it is, 
who the decision maker is, when they can close on it, and all of that. One thing you can do, guys, is type in your state that you live in, the word probate. So do Utah, I live in Utah, Utah probate, no low press, N-O-L-O press, not .com. Just type that in and you will get access to everything in your state around probate. It'll bring up your state laws, what it has to do. It'll, you will know more out of those two pages than anyone. And you will look like the expert when you're talking to these individuals. So they actually do want to do business with you because your competition doesn't know the full details of probate. So be the expert. Say, yeah, yeah. this can be a pain, but we're also here to walk our, our clients through this step-by-step step, holding their hand. It's not as scary as you think yeah. when you know the process and we know the process really well. We even have an attorney that can do this for a lot discounted price for all of my clients. We love helping people go through probate. It's really not that scary. Mm -hmm. um, we, we will hold your hand through the process. When you come across like that, people are like, oh, now I want to figure out how to do business with this individual. So that's something big. Um, coming back to um, Richard, the deal, you've been following this up for a year. Ultimately, what did you get this home under contract for? So, yeah, you know, I calculated the, uh, you know, I, I overanalyzed things, I think a bit, but I knew what I thought it would cost to rehab it yep. uh, and, and everything. So I'm calculating where I need to be. At. I need to be at 120 to be, to make a deal out of this. And so I offered 120 and she was, she was thinking she wanted, she was going to get 230. That's where she was at. I want to get I want 230. So I'm like, you know, I go, went over and looked at the house and I explained, look, you know, we got to put a roof. We got to fix the pool. You know, we all this stuff is going to cost money. You know, I'd like to give you a 230. I wish I could just give it to you. But, you know, we're, we're doing this to make a profit. And to make a profit, we need to be at 120. And she just said, that's too low. I won't take 120. Will you do 150? So I said, OK, let's do it. So I put it under contract at 150. OK. And I put it out to my buyers and I had a, a good, uh, good interest in it. I probably had eight or 10 of my buyers show up to see it. Okay. So that's always good when, when I get a feeding frenzy like that, you know? So, um, uh, but then the highest offer I got out of all of them was 155. <laughs> so I'm going to, I'm going to make 5,000 on it. So, well, that, you know, I'll take it. Uh, you know, I can't be 20 K McCray every day, but I'd like, to, even though I'd like to. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so I said, okay, so I, anyway, I, I, I locked, you know, I went to my buyer and he's a solid buyer. He's bought several properties from me. And I said, you're good to go at 155, right? And I said, look, I'm going to go see if I can get a discount. Will you still be good at 155? And he said, yes. So I went back to her and I said, look, you know, we can't do the deal. I told you we can't make money at 150. I, I can't really make any money at 150. Uh, I need to get it down. Uh, you know, I've talked to my money partners and, and we, we need to be much lower. She said, where do you need to be? And I said, you know, we really need to be at 125. And she said, will you do 135? And I said, well, let me think about it. Okay, I've thought about it. <laughs> yeah, so, so you're able to get it down for- I got it down to 135. And I, so I, I just wrote an uh, amendment to my contract. That's the way I do it. I just sent an amendment saying, we are amending our contract. This is the new uh, price, 135. So she was good with that. You know, I'm covering all the closing costs. I'm covering the cost of the moving company. Yep. And all of that, you know, so, uh, but I made a $20,000 spread on that one. Okay. So now tell me this, because here's the question I always have. And Jerry, maybe you'll have a question similar. If indeed you could have made, let's say $5,000, because um, you had it at 150 and you had a buyer at 155, right? Yep. What has you go back uh, to go renegotiate if you have someone that can give you a spread and honoring that versus where, where, what gives you, where do you find the, the line on doing that? Typically what I would do, I, I probably wouldn't do that because I have someone that's over and above that. Is there a strategy behind it or something behind it where, where it works and it still comes across as a win? Um, cause I, I always am a learner. I'm always a student to find that. 
just to find out, is there ways that it still, was she still felt like it was a win, where you felt like as a win, the buyer felt like as a win? Am I asking the right question, Jerry, when I say it like that? Yeah, I think, um, so the way I would kind of phrase that, Cody, is, um, or the way I handle that, because I run into that exact situation all the time, and I'm like, man. It's not worth it at 5K, right? 5K, I just don't want to do a 5K deal. I just don't want to do it. Like the yeah. Number. Right. Yeah. What I what I don't want to do is I don't I don't ever want to just go back and and get the seller to do a reduction just because. Yeah. Um, I want to have good cause. So yeah. I think Richard did this. He probably just didn't really explain it because he talked about originally being at the right number. He was yeah. at the right number. What I do is I go back to the seller and I'd say, listen, you know, I've been doing some work. I've been doing some due diligence. I've been running numbers. I've been getting bids. And I got to tell you, there's just a lot more work to be done on this property than I originally anticipated. I was hoping I could make 150 work. I was really hoping I could, but you know what? It just needs too much. And uh, unfortunately I'm out, you know, like I can't do it. And, and then, um, you know, and then that's a reason why. And I always want to give a re when they're like, well, why? Well, why? Then I'll say to them, look, the pool, the pool alone, that's $20,000 to fix that pool. Yeah. I was hoping it was five. I was hoping it was 10. The roof, I was hoping the roof was five. It's really eight. I was hoping that, and so I feel like if I can give a really good reason, maybe it doesn't matter at the end of the day, but I feel like if I can give a good reason to the seller as to why I need a lower price, then I feel like I, I can justify that reduction in price, right? Um, the other thing I wanted to kind of add to that was, this is a this is a move out of Cody's playbook, Richard. But when they when you said one twenty five, and they said one thirty five, um, this is something Cody does. He says, "Is that the best you can do?" Yeah. Right. And right. and right, Cody. Yeah, I love that. That's my favorite words. Or how close can you get to my number? Yeah. Yeah. Rather than take it, just just follow up with that question of, you know, is so you're at 125, 135. Is 135 the best you can do? Yeah. And they might be like, yeah, no, I mean, let's, I mean, can you do 130, you know, or whatever? And so just that question is money. That's like the most money question you could ask a seller. Is that the best you can do? Yeah. I love that. Whoever told you that is a flipping genius, Jerry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Richard Cray, McCray, let's do something for you because you did something amazing. So you did indeed turn it into a 20K McCray. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Go! Get out. Let's do it. You know what's coming for you. The golden bell. I love it, dude. So I'm glad to get clarity on that. I love that Jerry and you can both kind of share on that because – I've always wondered, like, where is it? Because I'm the same way, though, Richard. I don't know if I want to work for 5K. I know that sounds bad, but that's where I, I get really good just on the front end and do the best I can to never have to go renegotiate. And sometimes it just comes down to that. Um, so I, I always like to hear what the story is behind that because, A, I know you. We've hung out, um, in fact, not too far from Jerry's place. We hung out in Arizona at a mastermind. I got to know Richard McRae and I just love this guy. The guy has a heart of gold. He serves the people with high integrity, with high value. And so Richard, my friend, 20K McRae, you, you brought it, bro. And you were able to turn this disaster home into a 20K McRae. And for that, great job. Yeah, thanks a lot. And just, just like Jerry said, you know, I did go to the lady and say, look, you know, it's not going to work. We got, you know, we got the $20,000 pool. We got the roof. There's this growing on the walls. You know, this is going to, and plus I got to pay for your move and all of that. You know, it's, it's just really tight. Yeah. And then, you know, I asked her for the uh, price reduction. Yeah. I, I, yeah. That's, that justifies it. Right. So guys leave a comment right now and say, Richard 20 K McCray, you are a flipping genius. Yeah, let's hear it. I want to start posting these for Richard McRae. That website again, Mellow, just type in. It's not a website. Just type in the Google search, your state, the word probate, no low press, N-O-L-O -O, press, and it will, it'll pull that up. Um, 
Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see if we have some. Have you seen any on the side to do a couple questions before we head out? <laughs> I've been looking on the side. Let's do this while we're looking for some questions. Hey, Richard, knowing what you know now, this is one of my favorite questions. Knowing what you know now, you look back hindsight and you are, you are, have the 2020 vision. Is there anything that you would do differently? Let's say someone on this, we have many that are on this platform that are beginning. There's just at the beginning stages. What would you say to them knowing what you know now? Knowing now, let's see. So what would I say? Uh, I guess the thing is, you know, you, you've really got to psych yourself up, you know, just like the 20K McCray thing. You've got to tell yourself who you are. You can't get to where you want to be being the person you were before. You've got to become a new person. You've got to convince yourself that you're this new person who is doing these new things and making, you know, it's not just about the money. You have to think about how you're helping people, you know, because if it's just about the money, you probably won't be able to get it because even your subconscious mind will work against you, you know, because you have values uh, that you honor subconsciously. So you have to believe that you're helping people and that you're doing a good service and that you deserve to make the money, not just because you deserve it, but because you're offering something of value. And I think I, I would have liked to have uh, convinced myself of that at an earlier stage. Love it. Love that. Yeah, that self-talk, guys, is everything. You know, like you're your own worst enemy. You're you're the stumbling block in your own business. You're you're the bottleneck usually in your own business, and you get in your own way. And so that that self-talk is everything. Like like I someone made a comment that where I said at one point I don't get out of bed for five k. Um, when you kind of set a threshold of your value and what your time is worth. You stop chasing around little little teeny scraps, right? You start going for bigger deals. Like Richard can with confidence say, I need to be at 120 and and you know, build in a 20k deal. Why? Because he deserves a 20k deal. He did a lot of work to get that deal to a cash buyer, and you deserve every penny of that 20k. And when you believe that and that's your value and that's your worth, then you go get it, right? So I I hundred percent agree with you, Richard, on that advice. I think that's fantastic advice. Love it. Mindset's everything, guys. In fact, that's the difference between those that stay in the game and don't. It's not easy. I never tell anyone it's easy. I'd never heard Jerry just flat out say, oh my gosh, if you can't do it, it's because you're just not working. It's not easy. It's going to test you. It's going to try you, especially when it's something new, right? You don't know if you're doing it right. You don't know if you're negotiating right. You don't know if you're saying the right words. And so you're always second guessing. You're always questioning yourself. And then when you see it not work multiple times, which it's going to happen at the beginning, and you get the F-bomb dropped at you, at you, you get told to go pound sand, you get told all these different things in the book. And pretty soon, the more you hear this, the more it starts to play with your mind saying, you know what, maybe I'm not meant for this. Maybe I'm just not good enough for this. Maybe I'm meant to just stay at my, my corporate America job. But guys, the, the reality is it's going to test and try. If it's easy, everyone would be doing it. I know that sounds so cliche, but I'll tell you, it, it's going to test and try you. But if you can push through it and push through it and push through it and still do your job, still work at corporate America and just do this part time, just get your, get your confidence up, get your boost up. But the, the reality is that mindset's crucial. So Richard, I'm, I'm so grateful you did that. I've been able to see your mindset grow in such a positive way from the first day I met you to who you are today, I've seen a huge shift in your mindset. And I think that's uh, that's played a huge role and a responsibility in, in what you're doing today and how you're able to come across deals. So I commend you on that and I, I, I love that. Um, is there any spitball fire round that we wanna go with? Have you seen anything? Um, <laughs> I saw this one. When can I come work for y'all? <laughs> I love that. Um, there's been plenty of people that have been saying this in multiple ways. I, I think we've come across about 20 of these things. Um, but I'll tell you, great job. Thanks for bringing the heat and letting us know exactly what it is you did and making 20K. Guys, what would that do for you? Let me ask that question for many of you listen listening today. What would that do for you? If you could make an additional 20 grand this year from doing just one deal, 
what would that do for you? And then think about if you can turn this into a little bit more consistent and do two deals a year or three deals a year or two deals a month or three deals a month. You can start to see how this can drastically snowball and change your life. It changed my life. It changed Jerry's life. It's changed Richard McRae, 20K McRae's life. It's changed our lives. It's not easy, but it's changed our lives. And if you're willing to push through it and have that positive mindset, you can do this. I'm positive of that. I know you can do it. It's just pushing through it. So um, maybe some final thoughts, Jerry, and uh, some final words as we're coming up to our about our hour and a half mark. Uh, what are some of the things that you would leave with them? Yeah, well, you know, appreciate everybody for being here and your comments and your participation and being involved and asking questions and guys, just making time to further your education and learn this business. And, um, you know, the one thing to always remember is take some things you learn from this from this hour and a half live stream here, pick one or two key things, even one thing and immediately implement. And that's how you start to see transformation happen. It's that it's that immediate action, imperfect action, right? That gets you the biggest results. It's usually the small things done consistently or done immediately that gets you those, those big returns on that investment. And guys, I mean, now is the time to just get out there and make this happen. If you've been kind of on the fence or on the sidelines a little bit, don't do that. Get out there, pick up the phone, make an offer, make a call, talk to a seller, right? Figure out where you're at in your business and, and ask yourself, what do I got to do to get to the next level? What is the next level look like? And then take that action. And it's amazing when you do that, how much you'll progress and grow. And we want to turn, we want to turn your annual income into monthly income and your monthly income into weekly income and your weekly income into daily income, right? And you can do that in this business. And that's what's so amazing about this. So you guys are awesome. And uh, we're going to be doing this again. I'm I'm not going to be here, you guys, next week. Uh, Cody might keep it going. Do a, do something on the on his channel or on the I'll Facebook page. Definitely but, be doing it. But this is where my friend Jerry's going. He's going to visit my friends, Mr. Walt and Mickey. Yeah, I'll say <laughs> hi to him for you. Be sure to do it. They may not say hi back. There's no. uh there's this COVID thing going on. Well, yeah. Walt's not here to say hi back, but Mickey might be behind uh, behind a mask or something. But <laughs> guys. Uh, thanks again. Uh, any any uh, housekeeping items for when this goes off and goes into the YouTube channels? How would you like them to go from there going forward? Yeah, guys. So when the chat ends, the video will go will stay evergreen. Like it'll it'll be on the YouTube channels and the and the different platforms. So uh, go from the chat down to the comment section if you're watching this after the this live ends, or if you still have stuff you want to ask or talk about, go ahead and do that in the comment section. And both Cody and I will do our very best to try to get to those questions and, and keep that conversation going. So definitely, definitely do that when this ends. And that's, that's about it guys. Otherwise tune in every week, same time. And we're going to keep this baby going. Awesome. God bless you guys. Your journey. See you next week. Thanks Richard. Thank you.